Fatima, welcome to the Visionary Life Podcast. Thank you so much for being here. I cannot wait to dive into all things podcasting and why you started your most current company, Quill, and maybe even touch on work-life balance, which I know is a topic you're quite fond of. So thank you for being here. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me, Kelsey. You're so welcome. So I would love to know what life was like before you started Quill. So I think you were working at various marketing agencies for a bit, maybe in some other roles, but could you just give us a snapshot of that chapter in your life? For sure. I um, moved to Canada or Toronto from a small country in the Middle East called Oman in 2007. And after I graduated from University of Toronto, I joined the startup circuit and to help companies scale. So my background is in sales and I sort of specialize in joining very early stage companies and helping them go from no revenue to a lot of revenue. So that's really my background. Um, Probably, you know, quite a few years before I launched Quill, one of my mentors in the industry reached out. She was running a marketing agency and she brought me on to help her scale. And um, really, that's that's I would say that was the world that I was in before I launched Quill. And in this role, I noticed that a lot of corporate companies and Fortune 500 brands that we were working with uh, were moving really aggressively into the podcasting space. Um this is back before podcasting was so sexy. It wasn't a household name. Yeah. It was just something that brands and, and indie podcasters were sort of dabbling in. But I've always been a really big consumer of podcasts. Um, and so I decided to sort of take that risk to productize our services. And uh, we ended up selling the agency and I launched Quill. Um, and that's kind of how it was born. Mm, I love that. Did you know you always wanted to start your own company? Or was that just something that one day the light bulb moment went off, you had an idea and you're like, okay, I guess I have to become an entrepreneur. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because um, when I look at my upbringing and my background, um, entrepreneurship just isn't or wasn't a way of life. I, I My dad worked for the government. My mom uh, has never worked. She was a stay-at-home mom, which is ultimately actually the hardest job. Yeah. And um, in fact, my mom didn't even graduate or go to school past. I think it was like she she didn't even finish high school. So um, I, I definitely had a very unique upbringing in that um, taking risks and being a risk taker was just not something that I was really um, exposed to. My dad probably had two jobs, like all for the government. And and I, I would say like, you know, the impetus or expectation was that I, I would go to university and work a corporate job and climb up the corporate ladder. And, you know, it's as most Arab or South Asian parents say, become a doctor, lawyer, banker. Um, and luckily for me, I, I don't know if it was, I just didn't have the chops to go into any of those fields or, or what it was, but I, I moved to Toronto, went to university. So my family's from Oman, as was born and raised came here, went to University of Toronto and actually did do this corporate stick for a little while. Absolutely hated it. You know, it didn't really do well in a very structured corporate bureaucratic red tape environment. Um, I am generally someone who is very motivated by contributing to bottom line and just seeing your, you know, the results of your labor or hard work immediately. And so um, I was in a corporate I was actually at a company called Thomson Reuters and um, my industry or mentor from the industry, the, the person who actually launched the agency and, and asked me to come help her run it. She joined, she reached out to me and we went for coffee and she said, there's two women who are um, starting a dress rental company and they, it's called rent frock repeat. And they, they've just, they're literally in a basement putting together this company and, and they need a third partner and they need a salesperson. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, they have the operations and logistics down, they have the, 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 the strategy, leadership, marketing piece down, but now there's a sales piece that they're sort of missing and, and would you be interested? And that was the first time that I ever considered entrepreneurship as a viable career option. So I met Lisa DeLorme for coffee, who was the CEO of Rent Frock Repeat. And, you know, that coffee sort of turned into... Um, this lifelong career of never being able to go back and work corporate or for anyone else again. So from there, I joined 88, helped Aaron run this agency. And from there, I, I recognize this need for Quill and have been doing that ever since. Yeah. And I'm curious because 
I feel like when you said you hated the corporate world and you just kind of knew that that wasn't the right structure for you, I feel like that's very relatable to a lot of our listeners mm -hmm. because I hear from them all the time. Like, you know what? I just like, I hate this corporate job or I just feel like I'm not cut out for the corporate world, but I'm always kind of reminding them like, surely you are learning so much right now, some very valuable lessons or things that you can extract so that when you start your business, you are even more prepared than you ever would have been. So my question back to you would be looking back on your time in corporate, even though you feel like you weren't cut out for it, were there any really valuable lessons or just concepts that you picked up from working corporate that now you're very grateful for mm -hmm. in your entrepreneurial journey? No, that's a very half glass is half full way of looking at it. And, <laughs> and I'm going to be really honest, like, do I wish that I could go back and redo it and not do those six years in corporate? Absolutely. Really? I wish I had become an entrepreneur sooner. And okay. the one thing that I will say is if I hadn't done the corporate stick for so long, I wouldn't know to what degree it was so wrong for me. And I wouldn't appreciate the current role and space that I'm in. Like I love startups and whether I'm, I'm, a, you know, the founder of a startup in its mind versus even working at a startup or a very early stage startup, I love it so much. And if I hadn't done the corporate stick, I wouldn't have known the difference. So sometimes, you know, it, you know, that, that saying you have to lose something or have something to really appreciate it. It's kind of the reverse strategy for me where I, I did something, I absolutely detested it so much that now I'm yeah. so grateful. And even days when it's hard to be an entrepreneur and and it's more hard than easy. I, I still remind myself, well, what's the alternative? Would you ever want to go work for someone again? And the answer is a hell no. So um, I think that it's important to go through it to, to realize what you're not good at or what's not a good structure or fit for you. And yeah. the other thing I remind myself is, thank goodness there are people who love the nine to five, the, the yeah. corporate stick, the, you know, clocking in and out, want the stability and structure. Like if, if everybody wanted one thing or the other, I think it would just be a really difficult um, sort of non-harmonious ecosystem to navigate. And, you know, it's, I talked to a lot of my friends who are in the corporate world and they're always like, you know, how can you do startups? You know, isn't it hard with no job security? Every day looks so different, no work-life balance, no, all of these things. And I'm like, that couldn't be further from the truth. Like what yeah. this is, we're in 2021 now. We firstly, I would argue that at corporations, oftentimes you're just a number. I mean, we hear about mass yeah. layoffs happening all the time and, you know, really incredible people being laid off. And so my, my, my way of sort of justifying it is, uh, yes, I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty at startups. You never know if you're going to be around from one year to the next, but at least you matter. At least every single role is so indispensable to um, the entire ecosystem of your business. And you're not just a number. You're a person that has a relationship with your team. You're, everybody knows everybody. So in that respect, I would actually argue you have more job security at a startup. And then the second thing is, I would say that at least you're rewarded based on your merit. I mean, that whole seniority table where you'll get a promotion when it's time for promotion, um, when your boss moves, moves up or yep. you'll get, you know, your promotion will be based on, you know, X, Y, Z, what's written in our policies book rather than merit and hard work and what you deserve. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I would say that I'm just generally someone who doesn't like to follow the rules. So yeah. There's something for everyone. Totally. And I think that's interesting that you say, like going back, you wish you hadn't done it, but it gave you the contrast. And I think I love a good high contrast story that like I was in the corporate world and I hated it. And now I see the other side and I'm happy because I have something to benchmark against. So, you know, I do believe that time probably yeah. served you well and is Absolutely. reminding you every day that even as challenging as building a business can be, you're like, I would rather not be back there. <laughs> perspective is everything. I mean, I think it's so important to have perspective in every area and, and that experience gave me perspective today. So you can always connect the dots looking backwards. Yeah. So you mentioned that you were kind of an early adopter or early listener of podcasts. So when did that love of podcasts, because I've loved podcasts for many years too, but I never thought of starting a business in it per se, but when did that love of podcasts actually become oh my goodness, I have a business idea and I'm going to bring this to life. 2014 was um, 
was when the show Serial launched, which is the murder mystery that Sarah hosted by Sarah Koenig. Uh, she's actually the headliner for our conference this year in LA. That, yeah. it's, it's so serendipitous how things okay. come full circle, but she was actually the reason that I got into podcasting. So 2014, it became a household name. And I remember my best friend calling me and said, because I've always been a huge murder mystery junkie. When I was a kid, I would like load up on all the Nancy Drews. And, and as I get older, you know, obviously my taste in reading refined a little bit, but I love a good murder mystery. And so she called me and she said, hey, have you heard about this like new serial um, documentary that everyone's talking about? It's just becoming so viral. And it's about a young Pakistani boy who is, you know, convicted of, of murdering his girlfriend, but they're not sure if he did it or not. And this entire show is about that. And I was like, oh, sounds right up my alley. Yeah. Um, and then she's like, but it's in the form of a podcast. Like, do you know what that is? And I was like, I've never heard of that. Like, and she's like, yeah, it's not a show. It's it's not an audio book. It's, it's kind kind of like an audio book, but it's like, you know, this is where you can listen. So she sent me the link and sure enough, I was absolutely hooked. I mean, the, the fact that the show itself was just so like, you just couldn't put it down. I think the other thing that I found really interesting for me is I've always been a really busy person. And I loved the fact that I could be walking my dog and listening to a podcast, commuting yeah. to work and listening to the show. And I've been to the entire season in what it was like probably four days because I just kept, anytime I was not working, I was listening to this podcast. Um, and I would say that was like sort of the defining moment of when I became a consumer. After that, it was just like, oh my God, like just give me all the content in the form of podcasts. Yeah. Um, I sort of gave up shows, movies, Netflix. Totally. <laughs> and and that was my way of consuming content, which everybody has a preference. Sometimes it's visual, sometimes it's mm -hmm. audio. Um, and then, you know, fast forward when I was at 88 and we were yeah. starting to, you know, work with corporate clients, I started to think about, and this was the salesperson in me being like, what? other creative marketing campaigns can we do to be different? Like everybody does PR, everybody does digital ads, everybody does, you know, print campaigns. Like what can we do that's different that nobody's doing right now, but can maybe not necessarily reach a very like mass, mass audience, but reach a smaller pool of people that are engaged and, and, and really connected to your story is, it's a different type of marketing. I mean, you're essentially an influencer because I, I know the connection that I have when I listen to podcasts with the hosts of the show. I'm like yeah. absolutely obsessed with their content and them. It actually reminds me of the Ben and Jerry's story. Like I've never, I'm a huge ice cream consumer and I, I've never been loyal to a brand. But as soon as I heard Ben and Jerry's um, episode on how I built this, I've never purchased anything else because I'm just so in love with their brand story. And I'm like, okay, well, if that's what one episode can do for an ice cream brand, like, why don't we try this as a tactic for some of our clients? Yeah. And then from there, it just sort of took on a whole life of its own. And over time, I was like, okay, there's something here. Podcasting could just be a fad and I'm going to just risk it all and launch this company. And funnily enough, the pandemic happened and now it's, it's definitely a medium that's here to stay. Absolutely. And I'm like nodding along so much <laughs> with you because I'm thinking about a lot of the brands that I see around my house right now. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that was advertised to me on a podcast or the host uh, or the founder of the brand was totally. on a show and I just feel this deep sense of attachment and literally like I just ate a snack and I realized that I listened to the founder's podcast all of the time. It really does help to make that connection between brand and customer and for sure I mean remarkable. your podcast I mean you probably you've been doing this for seven seasons you said or seven yeah, years seven seasons okay so seven seasons you probably get this all the time with people reaching out and they're just so they feel like they know you and yeah, they do know you they they've do. been listening to you for seven <laughs> seasons and it's like just such an intimate connection that you develop with your listeners with your customers um and, and the stats are now there to prove it. So I obviously got into podcasting and as a consumer and also as a business when there wasn't a lot of studies done, but now there's actually data to back it up. Like 95% of people who start a show will listen to the entire episode season. Yeah. Whereas like with video content, a 30 minute video only has a 12% completion rate. Mm -hmm. And I think that gap is what we talked about, where it's one of the only marketing tactics where you can be actively engaged in another activity and that increases engagement rather than hurting it. And so, um, 
you know, it fits in really well with our busy lives. And I think that people have started to realize, oh, you can be consuming and edu- being entertained and being educated while doing monotonous tasks like chores. And it's like a perfect, I would say, advertising medium or content consuming yeah. medium for millennials. Oh yeah, absolutely. And you know, I, what I found interesting, I don't know if you said it on a podcast or it, ri- it was written in a blog, but you said podcasts aren't trends. In the 80s, everyone had a phone number or every business had a phone number. In the 90s, every business had a website. In the 2000s, every business had social media. And now in the era we are in, it's kind of like almost everybody seems to have a podcast. And it's almost like the thing that you do now. It's just if I want to get to know a brand or a person, I just go listen to their show. So on that note, (laughs) knowing that podcasts are kind of becoming more popular and it's no longer just for the early adopters, do you think the market of launching a new podcast is saturated right now? Mm-hmm. That's a question that I get asked all the time. And it, I, I truly do believe that we're very, very at the early, big, right beginning of the hype cycle. Like you got in very early if you've done seven seasons and mm-hmm. you are by default going to be a huge influencer in the next five to 10 years because Yes, in the 2000s, everybody had social. Um, I think in the next five to 10 years is really going to be that inflection point where every brand or individual will either have their own podcast or be advertising on one at the very least. And, you know, I think by default in 2007, if you were one of the first people on Twitter, you're an influencer today. And I kind of feel like that about podcasting. If you started early, I mean, we know it's true. Think about Joe Rogan. Like he started ages and ages ago and and, almost a decade um, probably. Yeah. And by like, do I, do I think Joe Rogan has like the most novel content? It doesn't resonate with me. Like it's not my type of show that I would tune into, but he has this cult like following because he's just been doing it for so long. And he's consistent, right? He didn't just like disappear for two years and then come back. Like he showed up early and he showed up consistently. Yeah. And I'm probably going to get in trouble for saying this, but, um, I really don't care. I'm going to just be authentic about it. it. (laughs) My sister and I were listening to an episode by, I think his name is Lewis house. Oh yeah. Yeah. Over the weekend. And I was just so put off by this episode. I mean, he was like interviewing someone who was like, um, or maybe it was Lewis house or was, he was interviewing someone who is like a really successful realtor. And this realtor was giving advice on how he like typically, does sales. And it was like a really grimy sales tactics that I was like, they're very manipulative. Like you're so proud that you're like able to cut these like seven figure deals, but like take advantage of people and swindle them. And, and, and this episode probably did so well because he has such a cult like following. And literally I'm like, this guy's an idiot. I don't know how his show is doing so well, but the one thing that he has going from him is that he started podcasting really early. So He's just an influencer today. I'm like, this guy does not deserve to be an influencer. Like there are so yeah. many better podcasts out there that are not getting the same traction or, I mean, it's podcasting is a marathon, not a sprint. So yeah. for you to catch up to where Lewis house is, I mean, I think ultimately, um, when you, there's 2.5 million podcasts out there, only 18% of them are in are active podcasts, which means producing regular episodes. But if you compare that with, YouTube channels, there's 30 million YouTube channels, 500 hours of content being uploaded every minute. There's 600 plus million blogs, 1.5 billion websites. So we're comparing those other marketing mediums. Podcasting is still very, very early and in its infancy. Hmm. Yeah. And you know, it's so funny that you say that about whoever it was, Lewis Howes, like, you know, he shouldn't be an influencer. And there's a lot of podcasts out there that I'm like, this isn't even that good. And to be honest, that's exactly why I started my show three and a half years ago is because I was consuming like five hours of podcasts every single day thinking these people are no different than I am. Like I have a better way. I think I can do this, you know, at least a little bit, an inch better than they can. And so for the listener right now, I know a lot of them have been thinking, well, I want to start a podcast, but how will I make my voice stand out? Do you have any tips for like how to enter the podcasting space in 2021 and have some form of success from it without feeling like it's going to be too saturated and nobody Mm -hmm. will listen. So what are the success secrets for someone starting now? Well, I mean, I think the first is you sort of answered it, getting over that imposter syndrome and knowing that no one else has more or less of a right to be putting out great content. There's a lot of influencers out there who put out very basic content. And if you have a story to share, you've 
just get over that imposter syndrome and start yep. it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I would say the second, I mean, I, there's so much content that I can share in terms of best practices, but um, taking, investing in your show, the way that you would invest in yourself, like taking your show seriously, like investing in the right equipment, putting in the hours, recognizing that podcasting is a marathon, not a sprint, um, setting up realistic expectations, because I think the biggest challenge in our industry is podcasters often will launch enthusiastically with a really great idea, but then get overwhelmed with the technical aspects of production and post-production and drop off leading to just, I would say, like a lot of inactive podcasts yeah. that, and the lack of creation of new production budgets. And so really set realistic benchmarks for yourself, accurate ones, um, and then take your show seriously. Like think of it as like a slow burn, a slow climb to the top, but um, you know, like very much similar to entrepreneurship. It's, it's not a sprint. It's like a 10 month, a 10 year marathon. So yeah. think of a podcast as like a little mini business of yours that, Every month you're trying to get your, your download count up every month. You're trying to track new audiences and new listeners. And, you know, in seven seasons later, you'll probably have a really great audience. Mm -hmm. I love that tip. And you're right. Like, I think the, the nitty gritty of all the tech and the editing and everything that has to happen after the recording, it tends to bog people down and they realize like, oh, this isn't just like a speak for one hour. And then it magically uploads itself to iTunes and Spotify, a lot of work has universe. So I'm curious, how does Quill come into play for somebody who has a small business, who's starting a podcast, who just wants to sit down and talk? Mm -hmm. How can Quill help them to get through this whole production process? Well, we actually have two business models. So a lot of the clients that I used to work with said, well, it's great that you are launching this podcasting company, but we need a team of people. We don't just want to work with one freelancer. Like we're looking for very high quality production um, shows. And so we we obviously have our agency called Quill, which uh, is a whole production company. We, we do everything from creating your show all the way to marketing your show. So the marketing piece is like a really big component for us. I always say creating a good podcast podcast is half of the work. And then the other half is actually making sure that it's reaching the right people. Yeah. And so we are a one-stop shop production team. We take care of everything for, for brands, but we also recognize that working with an agency is not always cost-effective, especially for a small business, um, for a bootstrapped company. And so we obviously understand the challenges of not having massive production budgets to invest into your marketing dollars. And so we also launched the world's first marketplace for podcasters, which is the Fiverr Upwork task rabbit, but for the podcasting world. Yeah. So you can go on to our marketplace. And if you're just looking for someone at an affordable price point for just editing or just recording and production support, or just, you know, marketing or whatever services you need, you may need everything. So full service is an option too. Um, And you can find people at your price point on our marketplace to help you get your show off the ground. Mm, And we- we also do consulting. So a lot of times people will go onto a marketplace and be like, I don't know what I need. It's such a new industry. So we do, um, we do the matching process as well. We'll do a consulting call with you, find out what your podcasting needs are, and then actually pair you with the best freelancer for what your needs are. That's really cool because you're right. I think a lot of people, they don't know what they need. They kind of, they have the idea for the show. They're the visionary who's like, okay, I've got this idea. I want to talk to these guests and these people, but they don't know all the rest of the steps that are involved in actually getting the show up and running. So I love that you kind of offer that, like sit down with us, chat with us, and we'll figure out who to pair you with and what steps you do need to outsource (laughs) in order to make this happen. Like stop delaying and let's go. (laughs) It is a really, it's an interesting industry because it's so new. It's kind of like the wild, wild west. And so I am, and my team, um, we're constantly educating ourselves and, and, researching and testing new tactics and ideas. And so um, we find that the education component is a key when it comes to moving this industry along. Like people don't know what they don't know and that walking them through the process and, and giving them accurate benchmarks, giving them accurate data uh, on what they should expect. Like that whole piece is just as important as, you know, giving them the tools to launch a show. Absolutely. Yeah. And so I know in addition to having kind of this freelance marketplace and offering post-production, You also do consulting with companies who are looking to start a podcast and make an emotional connection with their potential customers. Is that right? 
Yeah, so I would say that's the production company role that we sort of fulfill. We we yeah. mostly do all of the execution too. Um, we yeah, we typically work with like all of the banks, the Fortune 500 companies, to help launch their branded podcasts and integrate shows into their uh, larger marketing strategy. So, um, yeah, we work very closely with agencies as well as brands directly. Yeah, I find that really interesting now that like podcasting has become so much more mainstream that now businesses are realizing like this is an incredible way to have a micro touch point with our customer. And I've even seen like when I open uh, the iTunes charts, I see that like RBC now has a <laughs> podcast and like that's our know, podcast, like, the RBC just, disruptors. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, you know, doing really, really well. And I'm like, wait, I thought yeah. podcasting used to just be for like the individual, but it's no longer just like that. Now no. companies are recognizing that it's an incredible way to yeah. just like foster an emotional connection and actually have a voice behind your brand. So it sounds like at this point, podcasting is literally good for any brand or business yeah. or even anyone who wants to start a business, but just needs to at least start talking first and eventually will monetize it. Definitely. We have a really diverse portfolio. So we have the, you know, the RBCs, the TDs, the CIBCs, PWCs of the world. We also work with not-for-profits like Sick Kids Hospital. And um, we, we do, do a ton of not-for-profit work actually. And it's been a really great fundraising strategy tool. And I think what people don't understand is that podcasting can be used for so many different tactics. One, brand awareness and thought leadership. Two, telling your brand story and creating a more intimate connection with your customers, fostering more loyalty. Um, the third, which people don't even talk about is sales, customer acquisition. I mean, we were actually doing an internal study and we, we actually were just tracking for our clients to see all of the guests that they had come on their show. How many of those can, you know, convert into customers or vendors or partners or large hot new hires or just larger relationships. And like the close rate is like 60 to 70%. Mm -hmm. What other tactic are you going to get in front of someone for an hour of their time and start building a relationship with them? So <laughs> Even if you're looking for like a new sales strategy, why not create a podcast and invite all of your prospective companies to come on and share their story and build a relationship with them. And so, you know, people think of podcasting as just a marketing strategy. And I always like to argue that marketing and sales go hand in hand with this particular medium. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the way I see it, it's really a relationship building strategy because, you know, my goal is not to get rich off of the podcast. It's not to just invite on prospective clients. Like I'm not trying to sell you into my online course, but for me, what it is, it's a chance to meet incredible people, to build a relationship with somebody I may not have otherwise had the chance to. And um, I think, you know, when it all comes down to it, we need to go back to the art of human relationships, especially yeah. with COVID. We've kind of lost that. We're talking to everybody through screens and we forget that you cannot build a successful business by just hiding in a dark cave <laughs> with your office door closed, expecting that things are just going to take off. Like you have to continually yeah. be meeting people, be exposed to new ideas, just like have these serendipitous connections that can happen um, and be facilitated through a podcast. So yeah, I think it, it's really <laughs> cool to even think that a podcast can help in that sales process and kind of be a piece of um, a way that you grow your business. Definitely. I, I think everything you just said is so true and offline tactics have the power of forming stronger relationships and yeah. Um, I think it's easier to sort of sit on your couch and with, you know, e-commerce, like you said, most of your audience have e-commerce businesses. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so easy to just, you know, not interact with the outside world. But when I think about my sales career and how I've built my entire network, it's one handshake at a time through coffee meetings, in-person events, mm -hmm. um, moments like these where you're actually physically interacting with someone. And yeah. that's actually been my sales strategy. I mean, you know, if I'm being honest, most of, I would say, Quill's agency clients come in through inbound requests of people in my network who are like, mm. okay, you've built a brand around personal branding or podcasting. I know you know what you're talking about. I need a podcast. How can you help? And whether that's yeah our agency or, or maybe sometimes it's, we're not the right fit. And so I'm like, this is where you should go. Um, or this other agency would be a better fit for you. Um, but I would say, you know, that has been like my 
that's like my sales strategies to not be a salesperson and build those meaningful relationships. And it really helps you over a longer term period. It's not a sales tactic that converts right away, right away, like cold no. emails, but it is a tactic that will help you create a very sustained long-term pipeline uh, for the next five to 10 years. And so I would say podcasting is the best way to sort of build your network. Yeah, I totally see it as the slow burn too, mm -hmm. like podcasting and relationship building in that regard. Like I always think of the analogy of planting different seeds. And it's like, if you plant uh, basil seeds, they sprout in like three weeks. That's not podcasting, really? that's not relationship building. Yeah, if you plant um, carrots, say, within three to four months, you have carrots. But again, that's not necessarily podcasting. Like you might do your podcast for three months and still feel like nobody's listening. But if you plant apple seeds, again, this is like the marathon. They take three to seven years to finally bear fruit. And for me, like, it's just a reminder that everybody is on a different timeline with how they interact with your brand until when they decide to become a paying client, when they decide to take out their totally. credit card and work with you. And if you realize that some of the marketing efforts that you do operate like those apple seeds, they're going to take three to seven years. Like you don't just meet someone and say, yeah. Hey, do you want to buy my online course? Hey, do you want to become a client of Quill? It's like build the relationship, <laughs> know that they're on their own timeline. And when they need a podcast, guess who they're going to come to you. So totally. be in it for the long haul and recognize that you know, relationships take time and this is not a get rich quick scheme. Absolutely. And that's probably why that Lewis house episode bothered me more than it should. I'm still talking about it. It's been two yeah. weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and I, it's funny because I, I find that, um, well, especially at Quail, we're notoriously famous for turning down business if it's not the perfect fit. And right. I find that that genuine, sincere approach where you're not looking to make a quick buck actually results in a lot of business long term where either people will come back to you or send referral business your way. And I, I just think that there is a way of doing things. And sometimes the growth isn't linear. Like we have a client who has been podcasting for a year and you no, know, they had decent traction. I wouldn't say the best traction. And then over the last two months, they have just taken off on a whole life of their own and yeah. quadrupled in downloads. And now it's just like, you know, getting sponsorship and monetization requests and people want to purchase ad slots and they're just everywhere. And, you know, it can be that one thing where Apple's news and noteworthy section picks up their show and yeah. they get that, you know, bump in. And it's very similar entrepreneurship. It's like a, a 10 year burn. And, it, yeah. you know, it could be year five that, you know, gets you acquired. It could be year 10 that gets you to IPO, or it could be a bust. You just don't know. It's so true. And I don't know if this is the terminology, but do they call it like hockey stick growth? It's like slow, slow, slow. And then the tipping point happens and all of a sudden you're like <laughs> on this like rocket ship to success. And it's like, oh wait, you mean all that hard work I put in over the first three years finally has compounded and has created this, you know, mega machine. Hey man, it's all cumulative. Like it all amounts to yeah. something. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. So curious, um, you know, let's uh, shift gear into you as an entrepreneur, because I know that you have a lot of wisdom around finding work-life balance and really just running a company and, and making sure you're having fun along the way. So um, <laughs> number one, like, why are you so enthusiastic about finding work-life balance or whatever word you want to use there? Like, why don't you adopt that hustle all of the time, growth at all costs mentality? Funny, you caught me in a bad week. It's it's, <laughs> it's Friday afternoon and I'm just like, you know, like just zero balance this week. Yeah, but I think it that it's a season, right? It totally happens. I was actually reading or listening to this podcast by Jay Shetty, who is like my content guru. Mm -hmm. And he did an entire episode on people are seasonal, just like the weather is seasonal. And sometimes you have a season where you're like in growth mode. And sometimes you're in seasons where you need to yeah. chill mm -hmm. and your body's like, you need a break. And so ironically, um, Kelsey, when for the first 10 years of my career, I was the complete opposite of how I am now. I was hustle 24 seven, like 24 seven. I worked, you know, 17 hour days. I worked all the time. I had no balance and no chill. And 
I think that as I became an entrepreneur, I started to really think about the kind of leader and CEO I wanted to be and the kind of mm-hmm. culture. Culture has always been important to me. So even though I've always been the hardest working person in the room, yeah, um, I've always, it's been important to me to be part of a team that has great culture. And mm-hmm. I think a lot of the mentors and bosses that I've had have, have created a really great culture. And so having to start thinking about as a CEO, you're not just an individual contributor anymore. Now you have, you know, so many people reporting to you and you're thinking about retention and engagement and employee motivation. So that was a really big factor. And when I launched Quill, like what kind of leader and CEO do I want to be? And what kind of culture do our talent do I want to track to this company? And so yeah. right off the bat, I knew that I wanted people to have work-life balance. And funnily enough, that shift in mentality made me a better worker. Like I just, it was like this, oh, so I don't have to work 24 seven, but can still produce the same output. Yeah. And I became a better partner. I became a better friend. I became a better sister and I became a hundred percent a better CEO. I've just become really good at prioritizing my time. So I'll start working at like seven in the morning. Um, I'll wake up even earlier. So like around five or six, I'll be up. I'll be working by seven and I'll probably work on weekdays until six or seven. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I will not work on weekends and I'm like militant about it absolutely like my team is not allowed to work overtime it's a rule actually and you know you have like we have unlimited vacation like I'm not going to tell you when to take vacation you take it when you want to take vacation if you're burnt yeah. out you take vacation and we're absolutely not going to work on weekends and we're not going to work out of the nine to five ESC time zone obviously I put in extra hours I'm the founder and CEO sure, yeah. uh, my business partner does too but uh, outside of us it's you, you, you come in at nine, you leave at five, and then you have a life and we're all happy. We coexist. Well, we are motivated when we're here. We during those hours, I get so much done and I'm so present at work, but then when I'm done and off the clock, I'm so disconnected and present in my life. And it's just made me a a more, I would say efficient and better worker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's so inspiring to hear that like you don't have to participate in this kind of toxic growth mentality and to realize that, you know, our very clear brain waves are only available to us probably like 10 hours a day maximum. So it's like learn when you are thinking crystal clear. When do your best ideas flow? When does your best work come through? And just be very focused for those hours and make sure that when you're off, (laughs) you're really giving yourself time to recharge and whatever you need to do to break up your work day or take breaks when needed. It's like, yeah, I I just think that that balance nowadays is so important. And especially in this work from home environment where there isn't much separation from life from work. And you guys launched pretty much at the start of the pandemic, right? So have you ever had (laughs) um, the like in office culture or have you guys been remote this whole year, I guess? We have always been remote and we always will be. So we launched the remote company. I made that (laughs) hyper clear to my team. We actually acquired a production team uh, six months ago, I think. And when we acquired this company, we, I'm like, put it, it was in a part of our contractual paperwork. We will never have an office. So if that is not something you and your employees are going to be comfortable with, this is not the right fit for you because for me, it's about, um, I, and I understand some companies like, and you know what, I actually am a member of Soho house. So if people Mm -hmm. want, you know, that face-to-face interaction, meet me at Soho, we'll do a brainstorm. We'll go for lunch. We'll like definitely create that team culture, but do I need you to clock in and out and give me FaceTime? Do I need you to commute from Niagara or, I mean, also we have employees in like the U S and in the UK. So like, we're just a, a different, we're a tech remote company We're we're, run really differently, but we're doing really well. So I think it's just really questioning the status quo and being like, do you need your employees in the office nine to five to be running a successful company? Or is that office a necessary overhead? You know, who really wants to spend, and some people do, but most people probably don't want to spend an hour of their day commuting or getting ready and putting on their face. And yeah, we just, our mantra is, be a high performer, work hard, play hard, and do it on your own schedule. I, my CTO hates working in the day. He's like, I'm just a better performer at night. I'm a tech yeah. person. I want to be up and coding in the middle of the night. I'm like, you do you. I won't bother you until 1 p.m. in the afternoon when you're Love waking that. up. Yep. Yeah. And it sounds like you were just almost 
predicting this whole global pandemic because you launched in February, right? And then everyone had to go remote in March anyways. So yeah, it just quite ahead proved of our curve. theory. It just <laughs> validated what like I already thought. I think it also helps that I've always been in sales, which has always been a remote role. So even right. with companies who have a strong office culture, I've always been the one person who's in and out. Mm -hmm. But I, I know how I work well. Like I don't actually work well with a lot of distraction. Um, so I wanted, like, I, I built this company for what made sense for me. And then over time, I started to realize people are like, well, actually, this works better for me, too. We just really didn't have the luxury to um, be able to sort of like play in, in a space like this. And so, yeah, it's if you want to come in, come in. If you don't want to come in, you do you. Mm, absolutely. And I think the one challenge that I've personally experienced, I don't know if you relate to this, too. I've just felt always as an entrepreneur, a little bit lonely or isolated. And so that's why I felt like I needed to get out to a co-working space. And that's something that I'm always trying to problem solve for. Like, how do I get outside of this office of mine? And how do I feel less alone on this journey? I'm curious, mm -hmm. have you ever dealt with loneliness or just feeling a little bit isolated in holding this vision that maybe nobody else quite understands and paving your own path? Yeah, I mean, I would say that um, being an entrepreneur is an extremely lonely and sometimes isolating experience. I've always been really lucky because I have a business partner who's great and yeah. I now have, we're, you know, a, a pretty large team. So I have a really great pe team of people around me, but um, I actually own this women in tech breakfast event. And one of the biggest conversations that comes up is this, is how do you sort of curb that feeling of isolation and feeling like you're in this alone? And my heart goes out to solo founders. I don't know how you do it alone. It is really challenging. But um, if you are someone that's, you know, necessarily seeking out um, like that team environment and need people around you, that's how you thrive, like in that extroverted mm -hmm. setting, then then absolutely have a co-working space, you know. Yeah. There's so many project spaces we work. Um, for us, it's Soho House. So we have that option for people who want that interaction. But to be honest, like you can get that face-to-face -face interaction in other ways. It doesn't have to be an office structured environment. Like we yeah. are constantly traveling to conferences together as a team. We have one coming up in Nashville in August. Cool. Um, and we have like a bunch and we travel as a team together. And that's like our bonding experience. We do a ton of team events. We yep. um have monthly staff meetings. We have uh, weekly demo days. We, we do um, like we do the Jackbox stuff right now. It's like virtual. Yep. So there are other ways to be connected to your team that don't necessarily mean packing up your bag and paying $8,000 for an office lease. You just have yep. to get really creative and it's a difficult time right now. Like engagement is hard, but um, I think that sometimes engagement can come from coming up with new rules rather than just following the same thing over and over again. I love that. And it sounds like you are okay with that, like breaking the rules and challenging the status quo of what it means to run a company and especially in this virtual time. So really admire you for, you know, trekking forward through that and finding ways to um, keep the team engaged in just like creative methods. So Thank um, you. aside from that, are there any other business skills or just things that you've been looking to improve as the CEO of this company, like any business skills you're currently trying to level up? All the time. I mean, it's always a work in progress. I feel like I have still such a long way to go. Um, yeah. Actually, I, I just started teaching at U of T, so I'm going to be cool. taking a, a leadership course um, to help level up my skills as well as a new CEO. Um, I also am constantly reading new books. Um, yeah. Multiplier is one that I'm reading right now, but um, Startup CEO is another one that's like on my list and just like constantly finding ways to really um, improve. And actually we have year end reviews coming up in May. So our fiscal year is ending. And so I've scheduled review performance reviews and they're not like the performance reviews that you would typically think of. I can I, imagine not. <laughs> I've created sort of a 360 um, degree worksheet where everybody comes to the table prepared with what went well, what didn't go well. And then for me, I, I want the feedback, like what's one thing I should start doing, continue doing and stop doing. Yes. Um, because like, I really rely on my team for feedback on how to continue to do better. And I think just really creating that environment of, it's okay to challenge each other and it's okay to, you know, not everything needs to go well, but it's okay to give feedback and criticism. And I think that's um, 
definitely something my team is now getting used to. Um, we're, we're definitely a younger team. And so I think in the beginning it was like, oh my goodness, I just got like this feedback is, am I not doing well? Is it a bad thing? And it's like, no, we're all just doing the best we can. It's a learning experience, including for me. And I think the best way to sort of create that culture is to sort of remind your employees on how you're also leveling up your skills to constantly do better and be better. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And speaking of culture, I know a big part of culture is celebration and really, you know, uh, taking the moments to pause and acknowledge accomplishments. So I'm curious, have you guys reached any milestones that you've celebrated lately or anything internally that you've been like, Fatima, great job. Mm -hmm. um, what are some things that you've been able to celebrate in the past, say, six or 12 months? Well, given that we've only been around for 12 months, yeah. um, we, we just hit our one year milestone. We survived a COVID year. We acquired this production company six months ago. So we doubled yeah. in size. Um, we, we just launched Quail Podcasting Awards. So we're one of the Whoa. few awards out there. We also own the Rotten Tomatoes of podcasting called Quill Reviews. Um, oh, neat. So actually, Kelsey, you should um, go to our, our website and submit or get your friends and family to submit your podcast for, cool. um, we're just, we were so sick of the same podcast winning all of the award categories, like the reply alls, the how I built this. Yeah. Like, we know those shows are great. They've been around forever. We want to talk about some of the smaller indie productions. Yeah. So we, we launched our own podcast awards that are focused on not just the best podcast. We have podcasts for every category, but also podcasting companies. Mm -hmm. We wanted to highlight like the, the companies that are moving the industry forward. So best podcast app, best podcast tech, best cool. posting platform. Uh, so those, that award um, su submission just launched um, this week. Uh, so I would say that's a milestone. Um, being able to travel again as a team, our, our first conference is in August, um, podcast movement in Nashville, yeah. <laughs> which we're really excited about. Um, cool. And then in terms of like, I would say like little celebrations day to day, we've had to cancel a lot of in-person events or summer cottage trips or Christmas, um, Christmas party or holiday party or like, I, yeah, we, we, we do like, we do six mental health days in the summer as well. So we periodically every month or every other month, we'll try to take one full day off and it's called the mental health day. Yep. And in that day, you, in it, can be run it can be tacked onto a long weekend or it could be in the middle of a week but you're not allowed to work you're supposed to do everything that like helps your mental health um so we have like a bunch of those coming up and for some of them we had a bunch of team events planned but we can't do that so we're we're just um finding creative ways to sort of stay connected mm, so cool and i love the way that you're reimagining culture and kind of listening to your inner voice saying like you know what we should add these six mental health days and fun cottage weekends. And like you said, unlimited vacation. So I feel like you have so much wisdom to share there. And I can't wait to, you know, like have another conversation in a year and to see where uh, your company grows and how much it expands and impacts the world of podcasting. So thank you so, so much for being on the show. I feel like we could have extracted so much more from you. Um, if people want to learn more about Quill, maybe they want to use your services check out Quill Reviews and submit a podcast, like where are all the places that they should go to learn more? Because this just wasn't enough. <laughs> well, our website is quillpodcasting.com. So you can go onto our website and our conference is there, our review page is there, our award page is there. So like all of the little nuggets that we're sort of operating with are all under that one domain, quailpodcasting.com. And if you wanted to connect with me directly, I'm literally on all of the channels, um, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter. I'm my, my handle is Zadie, a Fatima. And, um, yeah, you can't not get through to me if you want to. I'm very accessible. So I love that. And thank you for being accessible. It's always so wonderful to be able to send an Instagram message or a tweet to somebody that you listen to a podcast. <laughs> of. So, um, thank you so much for being on the show and I wish you guys all of the best as you grow quill and impact so, so many people. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This was great. You have all the chops for a really successful podcast. I'm so excited to see this take on a life of its own. Thank you. That means a lot. <laughs>